Love on the Spectrum season two has dropped in Australia. Well, I'm gonna review episode one, season two of Love on the Spectrum. So get your patronizing autistic people hat on, <laughs> turn your blinkers on, we're only caring about neurotypical people, and let's go. Hey, I'm Orion Kelly, that autistic guy. So yeah, clearly I'm autistic. And since my diagnosis, I've devoted my time to advocating for autistic people. And I try to raise the level of understanding and acceptance of the autistic community to really improve the quality of life for not only autistic people, but those neurotypical people that may have autistic people in their lives as well. Now I do this in all manner of ways, including my podcasts my blogs, and these YouTube videos. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in and you'd like to help me increase the level of understanding and acceptance of autistic people, I would be delighted if you would consider subscribing to my YouTube channel by clicking that subscribe button and ring the notifications bell. You will never miss another video. Plus, you can find me on my socials as always. So it doesn't really matter what your social pleasure is. I'm out there. There's the Orion Kelly Facebook page. I'm on Twitter where I tend to tweet from time to time. You can find me on Instagram as well if that's more your thing. Or you might want to check out some of my oddly bizarre yet strangely popular videos on TikTok. All right, so let's get started. We'll talk about episode one of Love on the Spectrum season two. Now, just a quick catch up. For those that love the show, you know what I'm talking about. For those that are wondering, what does he mean? Love on the Spectrum is essentially an Australian made production where Australian autistic people are, uh, I guess, followed around on their quest to date, to find love. It's basically a dating show for autistic people, okay? In season one, Michael was a star. And what I remember about the aftermath of season one is Michael seemed to be in demand in the press. So radio stations, TV shows, publications, whatever, podcasters, whatever. They all wanted a piece of Michael. The reason why I bring that up is because that actually generated even more momentum for him to be a part of season two. Now, again, the premise is that Michael's a part of season two because he's still looking for love. It's his endless quest to find his true love, to find his wife, someone who ticks his all his boxes, someone who will fulfill him, complete him. But from my point of view, I suspect, and I, this again, it's that kind of weird, icky feeling you can't put words on. The producers have brought him back in season two, not so much to find love, more so because he was the star of season one. And in the end, you've got to keep your stars. There's some sort of commercial agreement going on, and clearly the production company are paid money by the ABC you know, when they commission the show, right? So there's money being generated there. I guess that's the point. Doesn't really matter what it's being shown on. It's about making money. They've brought him back because he's a star. Okay, cool. How much money does he get? Is he getting paid really well? Is he getting paid more than other people? Because he is being exploited or manipulated in my opinion. This is very tricky for me. He's there to find love, but hang on, I still feel like there's some of this level of exploitation around Michael. And you'll find as you watch season two of Love on the Spectrum, it's like there's a Michael show within the Love on the Spectrum show, right? It's kind of like this subplot. You've got your Michael show going on pretty much through all the episodes, but you've also got Love on the Spectrum going on. As an autistic person, it's just my own personal impression and opinions. I totally believe that Michael wants to find true love. I totally believe that Michael only has those intentions. And I 100% support and respect that. I'm talking about my feelings, my opinion, my review of the show produced by a production company. It's hard to explain and put my finger on, but there's just something about it that doesn't feel right. Now, the other thing that really bothers me, and this bothered me in season one, is the inclusion of families, right? All these autistic people are at least in their 20s. Some 30, some above 30, but they're all adults. The point here is we meet autistic adults. What the hell are their family doing there? In season one, this happened, Plenty of autistic people said, what's the deal with involving their neurotypical family members in the mix here? This is a show about adults, autistic adults dating other autistic adults. Who gives a crap 
what the family want to say, think or hear or feel. Or We're getting the opinions and thoughts of the family members before they've even gone on a date. They're adults. And we can look at it from all angles, okay? The first thing to remember if you're watching this video is I'm an autistic person and I'm providing you my own thoughts and opinions of a show on autistic people. And the reason that is, it's pretty simple. Okay, so there's a production company being paid money to produce a show about autistic people. Therefore, there's a show out to the world at large that is representing autistic people. And guess what? I'm an autistic person. The second thing to say is, I think it's pretty clear, and I don't think this is an issue so much as just a fact, watching season one and the first few episodes of season two, that Love on the Spectrum is a show about autistic people made for neurotypical people. Now, the reason why this can be problematic is what it then does is rather than it being a show that's representing autistic people in a genuine way, and that therefore helps other autistic people relate to them and feel like they're not alone or they're not so different to the people they see on TV usually, what it's telling me is, oh, okay, so Michael is the star of season one and two because we've realized that he makes the neurotypical people laugh. He's the court jester. Does he think he's funny? Do other autistic people think he's funny? Dig deep. Why are neurotypical people, non-autistic people, finding Michael or the show in general so funny? Well, they're probably finding it so funny because of the same reasons why we're discriminated against so much. Michael's honest. Michael's open. Michael, without even realizing it, is vulnerable. And in a way, that actually helps connect with an audience. But that's because you're on a screen. If I act the same in the real world, I'm stuffed. Oh, mate, you're so rude. Why are you so brutal? All these people acting like that in real life have spent their entire life being outcast. They get on TV and suddenly it's entertainment because it's not you. I'm not telling you the truth, right? I'm not telling you or giving you brutal honesty. This is very perplexing. That in the real world doesn't work. If it did, they wouldn't be looking for love. They would have found it. Now, right at the start of episode one in season two of Love on the Spectrum, they go back to Michael's house and the narrator, whatever you want to call it, says that Michael lives with his family. See, this is what I don't understand. If you are using autistic people to entertain the masses with a program that is shown worldwide on probably the biggest streaming platform there is, Netflix, this is a massive show. This clearly is a worldwide success. But to what end? Because if you're doing that and you're introducing the family as a character, can you just do it in a way where it actually helps the cause of the autistic community? Here's an example. Literally the first scene of us seeing Michael and his family together at home, his sister, I'm assuming his sister, or I don't know, a young woman that's not his mum, comes up to Michael, who's sitting in the kitchen with his mum and, and you know the young woman. She comes up to him with a jar, but she basically says something like, you know, hey, blah, blah, did this up too tight. Michael, could you open this jar for me? What the f What the f You're a grown woman. Work it out. What, so, so what we're doing now is we're, we're making out autistic people to be like, I don't know, what are we like, Hulk-like superheroes? <laughs> no worries. I'll get my autistic strength. One second. <laughs> hey, I go, jar's open and it's shattered in my head. <laughs> yeah. Like he's the jar guy in the house. Oh, Michael only lives at home still because he's the jar guy. I would have moved out a year ago, but I'm the jar guy. Who's going to open jars if I move out? On to the dating. <laughs> because that's the point of the show. Now, in episode one of season two, Michael did some speed dating. Now, Michael meets, I don't know, five or six women. And from my own impressions and memory and personal opinion, I think one out of all the women was also autistic and the rest were, were neurotypical to the best of my knowledge, were, were not autistic women. Some of the experiences Michael had with the, I don't know, three minutes he got with some of the neurotypical non-autistic women, I found really uncomfortable. I guess they were kind of patronizing and 
they weren't really helpful for autistic people. So Michael was vulnerable enough and open enough and honest enough to legitimately share his real passions and love to another person he didn't know in an attempt to connect with that person. This is a really big thing. If neurotypical people think about that, I just want a guy or I just want a girl who will just be honest and open and just open up. You know, that people always say they won't open up. I just can't get them to open up. There's too many layers or too many walls, right? Michael does that and he shares his passions, which include uh, Thomas the Tank Engine, collecting toys, you know, characters in movies, doing impersonations of, of characters. You know, these are his genuine true passions. And, you know, a couple of women, I don't know how to say it. I mean, I think one person said, oh yeah, I know a three-year-old who likes that show too. I understand that people dating people isn't always pretty. I get that. But you have to think, why are we watching this in the first place? Okay. And I understand why. It's for entertainment, potentially people finding love. It's like any dating show on TV. It's got nothing to do with actually finding love. It's about entertaining us at home watching the show. So the speed dating point is Michael was given the opportunity to meet neurotypical women, but it was for three minutes, right? It's not a real date. It's not a real opportunity. You're not gonna find love on the spectrum on speed dating. You're barely gonna make a, as an autistic person, you're barely going to make a connection in the three minutes you get or however long you get. I would love to see more actual dates, not speed dating, more actual one-on-one -on -one dates of autistic people with people who are not autistic. They may have other disabilities, they may be neurotypical, it doesn't matter what they are, that we just need some diversity. We need to see neurodiversity in the dating world on this show. A new autistic person we meet on episode one of season two, Love on the Spectrum, is Ronan. Now, this is where I give props to the producers of the show. In season one, Sometimes when they were introducing people, they had this really bizarre like voiceover doing a fun facts kind of thought bubble. This is Orion. Orion likes walking on the beach and hates the sound of the ocean, which makes no sense. Why are you walking on the beach if you hate the sound of the ocean? It doesn't make a difference. They're stupid, stupid things. A massive, massive opportunity to actually provide some sort of, just a small level of insight and understanding of autistic people to the wider world and actually make a difference. But no, I'd rather say something stupid. Like, I don't like the sound of a trumpet being played in a bathroom. What, who, what? But props to the producers when they introduced Ronan, who's an autistic person, they said, hey, Ronan, tell us about you. They asked Ronan questions. They let Ronan do the talking. Thank God for that. That's a thumbs up. Well done, producers. Instead of silly, stupid talking for them, asking them stupid questions and getting stupid answers, you've actually let the autistic person speak for themselves. So that's a thumbs up. Well done. Now, the, the next issue in introducing Ronan is back on the issue I'm talking about earlier in the video, so I won't harp on it, which is the inclusion of family again. Okay, so we are introduced to Ronan's mum and also his brother. This has got nothing to do with the brother and the mum. I'm sure they're fantastic family members who have supported Ronan and, and done everything in the best interest. So there's no issues there. I'm talking about the production of the show by the producers. After Ronan talks about himself, we see him playing the piano. Now that's cool. Ronan is a muso. He can play instruments. That's awesome. Like I'm all for that. In the end, after Ronan finishes playing the piano, you know, his brother says something like, and again, nothing about the brother, just about the editing of the show. His brother says something like, you know, hey, you'll really be able to impress a, a woman with, with that, you know, with the playing of the piano. Really? Okay, so, so Ronan's gonna grab his piano, he's gonna drag it through the streets of Sydney, and oh, I like the look of that one, hey. Hey, how you going? My name's Ronan. One sec, one sec, one sec, one sec. <laughs> It's like a trumpet piano. Hey, how do you like me now? Yeah. No. Now again, as we get to know Ronan, just like Michael, there's this over-inclusion of family members, and I know we're trying to get to know people on the show, but you can get to know people on the show by getting to know the people on the show, right? We don't need the family. There's, the perception created could be autistic people need neurotypical family members to talk for them, to communicate for them. Now, sure, there are non-verbal autistic people, but guess what? They have devices and other ways 
of communicating. Ronan's there, he's in the room, and the producer's firing off questions at the mum about Ronan. He's standing right next to her, but she's looking at the producer, and it's, the mum says something like, all of us in the family, so you know, everyone he knows and holds dear would never have imagined he'd be at the stage he is now. You know, all of us, the whole family, would never have imagined he'd be a 21-year-old man who had a job and had finished school and wanted to date people. He's autistic. He's not a rock. And the mum also shares she was kind of concerned that he wouldn't want to be with people or hang out with people when he gets older because he liked to be alone when he was younger. Ronan's autistic. As an autistic child, you're probably gonna spend a lot of time playing by yourself. You're probably not gonna be overly fussed about the company of others, but it doesn't mean that as you go through life, you still don't want the company of others or you still don't want connections. It's, I've got a two-year-old who likes to eat dirt. I'm not gonna be surprised if he doesn't like to eat dirt when he's 21. Anyway, this is in no way about the brother or the mother or the family members. This is about the producers of the show putting so much weight in the words of family members talking about an autistic human being, an autistic adult. Let's move on to the next autistic person we're introduced to in episode one of season two, and that's Cassandra. Again, I wanna give props to the producers, none of the weird thought bubble introduction, the producers simply asked Cassandra, hey, tell us about yourself. Tell us about life as an autistic person. I think they might have even asked a question like, have you ever been told you don't look autistic to get her response? And again, that's a thumbs up. I'll tell you why it's a thumbs up, because that is the producers educating the wider community watching the show through the voice of an autistic person. Like they're not talking about it, they're asking the question. They're letting Cassandra connect to people. That's a big thumbs up. So this show, it's a mixed bag. There are things that I can point out that hopefully will help the continued progression of the representation of autistic people. And there's things I can point out that are, hey, well done guys, do more of that. So the first autistic woman we're introduced to, Cassandra, goes on a date in episode one. And she goes on a date with Tom. And just when I thought we were doing well, guess what? We get the thought bubble, weird kind of walks on the beach intro for Tom. And this is not Tom's fault. Again, the producers have to stop this crap. It's rubbish. And this nothing more says, this is a show for neurotypical people to be entertained at the expense of autistic people. Okay, so honestly, this is Tom. Tom likes to scratch a dog's itch and play the guitar, I don't know, like rock music on the guitar or something. If you wanna dig deep and actually ask Tom about these things as an autistic person, potentially maybe the feeling of a dog, scratching a dog, the feeling of that, okay, might be a sensory thing. Connection to animals is a big thing for autistic people. Caring for animals, playing music, feeling the music, the idea, the discipline. You can play a guitar by yourself for hours. You don't need anyone else around. The sound it may give, an electric guitar compared to an acoustic guitar. You've got to dig deeper. You can't just say, loves to scratch a dog's itch and play the guitar. You like to scratch dogs? Wow, he's a keeper. And to make it worse, after they've done Tom's likes, they do Tom's dislikes. And it's Tom doesn't like windy days and crooked pictures on the wall. Hmm. Okay, again, dig deeper. Dig deeper, guys. Doesn't like windy days. Why do, you, why do you think that is, if that is even the case? Do you think potentially it could be the noises, right? The sounds, the feeling, the wind, the things flying through the air, the lack of predictability, the feeling it gives your body. Things that aren't straight on walls aren't about the things on the walls. They're about order and predictability and things being just right. Autistic people are different. Everyone's different. We're all humans. Me, specifically as an autistic person in my experience, if you walk into my space, it's very clean. It's very matter of fact. I could walk into a room and notice if something isn't where it should be and I'll put it back, right? So I understand the picture on the wall thing, but you don't, they're not selling, whoa, whoa, you, you don't like windy days? Well, that's, I'm sorry, that's a deal breaker, man, because nothing gives me pleasure like 
sheer wind. Now, long story short, the date doesn't go well with Cassandra and Tom. And it's really got nothing to do with the two of them. They just didn't connect, right? That, that's dating. So there's no issues there. The only thing I would say is the date was very awkward. Now these are two autistic people going on a date. And I just wonder, this is the situation when I start to wonder how long do we need to watch that before it goes from an insight into autistic dating to just a sheer exploitation for the entertainment of the neurotypical community. One of the big things in season one that I really took issue with was the use of a relationship coach or a dating coach. Now again, like I've said through the whole video, this isn't about the relationship coach, the dating coach. I believe her name's Jody. This isn't about her. This isn't about her expertise, her qualifications, her work. No, not at all. But my issue on season one was we were getting a dating coach to teach an autistic person how to be like a neurotypical person and date by neurotypical standards with another autistic person. We don't need a, a relationship coach to come in and teach an autistic person how to not be autistic when they're dating another autistic person. That's ridiculous. So that's my issue. The experience between Ronan and Jody, I thought was actually okay. There was a few weird things like Ronan answered the door by saying, hello, Jody. And then Jody responds back to Ronan, hi, I'm Jody. Yeah, yeah, I got that from when I said, hi, Jody. I mean, it's like, I don't, this is what, anyway. The experience with Ronan and Jody and her, her coming in to coach him for his first date with someone who I'm assuming isn't neurotypical, again, it's questionable. And what did he get out of it? By the way, let's get this straight. If you think that autistic people have to have the same way of dating as neurotypical people, then you're an idiot. I'm an autistic person. So I know, I've got experiences. It's not the same, okay? Whether you date a neurotypical person or an autistic person, your only job is to be yourself. You can't be yourself as an autistic person if you're dating by neurotypical standards. That would be masking. That isn't yourself. Who wants to fall in love with someone that's not even themselves? Now, there's what I can only describe as a legitimately and genuinely beautiful moment in episode one. I loved it. Michael caught up with uh, a school friend, so someone he, he's known since school days, they're now both adults, for a catch up. And she's a neurotypical woman from everything that I can gauge and gather, who has a genuine connection and friendship with Michael. Now, the first thing I wanna say about this is, I'm so grateful that there are people in the world that are prepared to actually connect with people and develop friendships, relationships with people who aren't like them, but to not judge them for being different and to not treat them differently. Like for example, my wife is neurotypical. She calls me out if, if there's something that needs to be called out, right? Or she can give me crap. She, she treats me the way I would want to be treated, okay? And Michael's friend, I think her name's Brianna, you know, she gives him some crap. You know, she, she calls him out, you know, the, the, the overthinking, the overanalyzing, the things that, you, if you really know an autistic person, you really know their things. So this, this is a beautiful moment. And in the end, it's just a conversation between Michael and his, his friend about how the speed dating went, he had a match, and you know, how should I approach it? You know, when I call her, what do I say? What's the date like? You know, how should I look at it kind of thing? Because Michael's probably already thinking about marriage. And you know, his friend who knows him can really, you know, she can bring him back down and kind of keep him focused. So, you know, I just want to say this is one of the most beautiful scenes you're ever going to see on an autistic show. Because it's a, it, it proves my point exactly. That here is a genuine connection between an autistic person and a non-autistic person that actually is mutually beneficial and is in no way patronizing or superficial or misguided. It's just beautiful. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for this scene. Now after her failed first date, Cassandra gets a second crack in episode one. Cassandra goes on a date with a guy called Sam. How do I know that? Because instead of asking Sam to tell him about himself, guess what happens? Yes, you guessed it. We get some fun facts. Again, you know my thoughts on this. It's ridiculous. Sam likes a good whiskey. And I don't know, what, is, what did they say? He likes 
the smell of the earth after it rains? I mean, seriously, how is this helping? Oh, you, you like smelling dirt, especially after it rains? <laughs> I'm gonna go now. Catch you later. Actually, before I go, I might play the piano. This will, this will get you back. <laughs> but my favorite was Sam doesn't like impatience. <laughs> if there's one thing I love, it's impatient people. <laughs> no, no one does. And also, Sam doesn't like the effects of climate change. I can't tell you the amount of people, I'm walking the streets and talking to people, which is never happening because I'm autistic, and I can't tell you how many people I say, hey, what do you reckon about the effects of climate change? And they go, bloody great. They're fantastic. Oh, yeah, more of it, please. <laughs> Maybe we'll just get rid of the whole atmosphere and just burn up. <laughs> That'd be, whoa, solar radiation, <laughs> good stuff. The effects of climate change, he doesn't like them. Who does? And also from a diversity standpoint, again, a thumbs up to the producers because in this conversation, the date between Cass and Sam, they both talk about uh, their connection to bisexuality, not so much saying that's the label they would use, but they do talk about how they feel attracted to, uh, you know, to more than one gender. So that's a good example of integrating different diversities, sexual diversity. It doesn't mean we've got all the way with neurodiversity and, and, and race, but we're doing okay in episode one. So there are my thoughts on episode one, season two, Love on the Spectrum, and hang in there, stand by for my thoughts on episode two season two of Love on the Spectrum. In the meantime, check out more of my videos. That'd be awesome if you'd share them around. I'd really appreciate it if you consider subscribing to my YouTube channel simply by clicking that subscribe button. You'll not only never miss out on any more videos, but you'll help me reach more people. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching.